Hey everyone, welcome to episode number six of the Myths of Christmas. Today's myth, hey Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day rule the nations and save our sons and daughters and give sight to the blind man? Yeah, she knew. The popular contemporary song sung around Christmas in churches every year has a rhetorical question that can leave us with the impression that Mary was pretty clueless about who her son would be and what he would do. But Luke's gospel shows us that this isn't the case at all. Let's look at Luke 1 for a second. This is starting at verse 30. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So first important point to make, this is the angel Gabriel here. And like in the book of Daniel, Gabriel is a messenger of the covenant. So whenever he appears, what's assumed is that what he's about to say involves some sort of significant announcement about an event regarding the covenant that God made with Israel. And that's exactly what we see. Gabriel's directly quoting the words of the covenant that God made with King David back in 2 Samuel 7. And this is what God said to David back there. This is starting at verse 12. He says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. So Gabriel is telling Mary that Jesus would be the Messiah, that final king of Israel from David's line that would reign from Jerusalem, whose rule would extend from there over all of the nations. And this is how a first century Jew would have understood Gabriel's words. So did Mary know that her child would one day rule the nations and give sight to the blind and save her sons and daughters from oppression? Oh yeah, no question. Now we can't forget that Mary knew the larger Jewish story. Like she understood the law and the prophets and she was full of expectation for the God of Israel to do everything that he had promised. And so she sings this little song a few verses later in Luke chapter one that's often been called the Magnificat, which is just Latin for magnification. In so many ways, Mary's song parallels Hannah's song from 1 Samuel chapter two when Hannah was birthing Samuel. And what's really important to see from these songs is that both Hannah and Mary understand the birth of their children as having huge significance for the nation of Israel as a whole, not just their individual lives. Like Mary says things like this in Luke chapter one, verse 51. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. Like, what did the birth of her baby have to do with bringing down the mighty from their thrones and exalting the humble? Like, well, this only makes sense if she sees and understands Gabriel's words in a covenantal context, that God's mercy to her meant that God would still have mercy on the whole nation, and that her son Jesus would be the one who fulfills the covenantal promises to restore Israel, to defeat Israel's enemies, and to rule in righteousness and justice. Now, verses 54 and 55 make it clear that Mary is seeing things through the lens of the covenants. She says this, He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Now, these covenantal promises of blessing and the Davidic throne in Jerusalem might be foreign to the modern Christian, but that's only because there's so much historical and theological baggage that's contributed to a universalizing or a spiritualizing of all these ideas. But these promises are still for a time yet future. The events of Jesus' life didn't redefine them, and Jesus isn't sitting on the throne of David in Jerusalem right now, and nor has the throne of David been redefined to the cross or my heart or something. Now, what does all this mean for Christmas? Well, I think that we could say that Christmas is eschatological, meaning it has so much to do with the end times, as we would say it in the modern day, or as Jews in their day would say it, the end of the age. Our response to the birth of Jesus should be like the response of the shepherds in the fields in Luke chapter 2, when the angels told them about the birth of the Jewish Messiah. 
they rejoiced because God was acting in fulfillment of his covenant. And they knew that God was going to do everything that he said. And so this is why we rejoice and we anticipate the day when the God of Israel fulfills his promises to Abraham and to David and to the whole nation of Israel, because the result is going to be blessing and eternal life to the rest of the nations. Does this make sense? This is why Christmas is so awesome. Well, that's it for this one. Drop a like on this video and share it with your friends. And if you're interested in learning more, check out all the videos here on my YouTube channel. You can also check out a podcast that I do with my fellow pastors where we talk much more about this exact subject, and the link is in the description below. God bless, and I'll see you in the next one.